Hello, dear students. How are you and how things are going? I, I hope that all is well with you. I hope that you are studying, following, and doing your assignments. Today, I welcome you to our 13th lecture about poetry. Because, you know, after that, we are going to move to drama. After having covered a number of poems, uh, which are uh, relatively modern, uh, we are going to study uh, an ancient form of poetry known as the ballad. Um, the reason why I kept uh, the ballad uh, till the very end is that I wanted you to have an idea about uh, poetry first, and then we can move to talk about uh, a type of poetry which does not really um, relate to modern uh, life. But really knowing uh, ancient forms is essential in our understanding of, uh, of poetry. Um, if you think of uh, old forms of poetry, you know they are the parents of modern forms. And the ballad is one of the most uh, important and famous types of old poetry. Um, if we want to talk about uh, the early beginnings of the ballads, I think um, it um, can be uh, traced back to the medieval ages, the Middle Ages, uh, when people had no means of entertainment or any methods of having fun, let us say. And poetry was the most important form of entertainment where poets would compose poems um, uh, without uh, having to write them down. They just uh, uh, recite them and sing them to the uh, accompaniment of a musical instrument. And that's why uh, most of the ballads uh, can be uh, sung and they were really famous songs uh, during their lifetime. Um, ballads also embody the culture of the nation that produced them. Most of the ballads that we have uh, are written in the Scottish or the Irish uh, uh, dialect. So let us try and talk about, about, uh, about ballads. Uh, ballads can be classified as an objective form of poetry where the writer does not really uh, focus on his identity. And having said that, I think um, you will realize that this is not uh, similar to the lyric. If you remember, we spoke about lyrics and we said that lyrics are expressive in a personal manner. They often express the feelings and the emotions of, of people uh, in general. So usually if we think of ballads, we have to think of the uh, objective forms of poetry where personal feelings are not very, very uh, important, but rather um, we feel that the poet expresses the feelings of a large group of people. Uh, ballads can be uh, classified into uh, two types folk ballads and literary ballads. Uh, folk ballads, it's very much like when we say in Arabic, Shabi. Folk ballads. The other one is literary ballads. Okay, what's the difference? Uh, folk ballads uh, are ballads which are written anonymously. That is, the writer is anonymous. And I mean by anonymous, unknown. The writer is unknown. Okay, we don't know exactly who wrote ballads because as, as I told you, they were very much like uh, popular songs uh, recited by uh, singers uh, and uh, they have different versions uh, depending on uh, the, the group uh, of people who, who sang them. So if you want to know that this ballad is folk, you have to know that it has no author. That is unknown authorship. And number two, we have something we call literary ballads. And literary ballads definitely have authors. And these authors wanted to imitate folk ballads. And therefore, we notice that 
literary ballads are written in imitation of folk ballads by famous writers whose names are often well known to the to the society uh, so uh, if we want to distinguish ballads we have to uh, to to say that ballads are narrative poems they are not lyrical yani they are narrative poems which means that they tell stories they tell stories number two original ballads or authentic ballads are always anonymous you don't know their authors and number three ballads are meant to be to be sung um i think nothing can be clear without having an example our example for today is going to be sir patrick spence sir patrick spence Now, Sir Patrick Spence um, is one of the most famous ballads. And I have to tell you that if you want to, like, Google Sir Patrick Spence, you will have different, you will have different uh, versions of the poem depending on the society uh, that uh, read the ballad. Okay, now let us read together Sir Patrick Spence. And of course, you have to excuse the, uh, the difficult words that you have, but uh, this is exactly how ballads were written. But as we explain the poem, I think uh, things will be easier for you. So let us start. The king sits in Dumfling town, drinking the blood red wine. Oh, where will I get guide sailor to sail this ship of mine? Up and dispatch an elder knight, sat at the king's right knee. Sir Patrick Spence is the best sailor that sails upon the sea. The king has written a braid letter and signed it with his hand and sent it to Sir Patrick Spence was walking on the sand. The first line that Sir Patrick read, a loud laugh laughed he. The next line that Sir Patrick read, the tear blinded his e. Always this has done this deed, this ill deed done to me, to send me out this time of the year to sail upon the sea. Make haste, make haste, my merry men all. Our guide ship sails morn, which means our good ship sails the morn. Oh, say, na say, my master dear, for I fear a deadly storm. Late, late, yestreen, I saw a new moon with the old moon in her arm. And I fear, I fear, my dear master, that we will come to harm. Oh, our Scots nobles were right lathe to eat their cocked heels shoon. If you go to uh, to page forty four, you know the 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 ballad starts forty four. Uh, sorry, forty three, and if you go to the uh, to the other part of the. Of the ballad, it's page 44. But long o'er the play were played, their hats they swam a boon. Oh, lang, lang, may their ladies sit with their fans into their hand. Oh, ere they sir Patrick spins, come sailing to the land. Oh, lang, lang, may the ladies stand with their gold kims in their hair, waiting for their own dear lords, for they'll see them na mere, which means no more. Half or half or to appear door, it's fifty fathom deep, and there lies good Sir Patrick Spins with the Scots lords at his feet. Uh, sorry, because I don't have a slide for this um, for this part, but it's page forty four. Now, what is Sir Patrick Spins? Sir Patrick Spins is actually a very famous and popular uh, ballad 
of an unknown origin. And you know, this is normal because you know, most of the ballads uh, are like this. The poem has many versions with considerable variation in length and detail. And I want to make this very clear to you, dear students. Uh, ballads were written, uh, uh, I, I think, were composed orally. I mean, they were not written. They were composed orally. Many people who lived uh, during this period of time were illiterate people. They didn't know the, the, the skill of reading and writing. So these poems were composed orally and they were passed from one generation to another generation. And uh, these ballads uh, had the same story. But some people uh, who uh, listened to these ballads uh, while being uh, sung had a slight idea about uh, these ballads. So there was no need for a long ballad. But when these ballads were sung to a group of people who uh, didn't know the story, I think they need a detailed uh, version of the story. So for those who know the story, we don't need a long uh, detailed ballad. For those who do not know the story, we need a long detailed ballad. And that's why if you try to Google the, uh, the ballad, uh, any ballad you choose, or you try to find it in a book, you might notice that the same ballad has different uh, versions and each version uh, is different from the other in, term, in terms of length or probably the addition of a section here or, or, or there. And that's why we have many versions of the same, of the same ballad. Um, I want also to emphasize that ballads used uh, uh, the Scottish or the Irish dialects. Uh, this is the reason why our students, specifically uh, Arab students, uh, find it difficult to understand uh, these uh, ballads and they find them different from the, uh, from the language they know. But uh, keeping the same uh, words in the same way is actually a way of keeping uh, the history of these ballads because these ballads were preserved or kept through oral transmission long before they were written down. You know, you have to know that when people came to know reading and writing, they started to preserve or keep their folklore by writing it down. Okay, and this is why we started to have written ballads. But before that, ballads were not written. And our poem, uh, for today, which is Sir Patrick Spence, is exactly like most of the traditional ballads. Uh, they, it is transmitted orally. Okay, now I want to, uh, to go a step further and to speak about the nature of ballads or what topics exactly uh, ballads often uh, portray. Most of the ballads have a sad theme and uh, they end uh, tragically because ballads uh, often relate to sad and tragic stories and these stories often have danger or death as their topic now does this apply to our uh, uh, to our poem sir patrick spence definitely yes because sir patrick spence is exactly like other ballads now what's the story of our ballad there was a Scottish king and this Scottish king wanted a sailor to sail his ship. When I read about the story, I discovered that the king wanted the sailor because he wants to send his daughter to her husband. Uh, and therefore he needs a good sailor to sail across, across the sea. And uh, an old knight who knows the king tells the king that if you want an excellent sailor, you just seek Sir Patrick Spence. So who is Sir Patrick Spence? He is the best sailor in Scotland, and therefore he is the most suitable person to uh, carry out the task, which is to send the king's daughter to her husband who lives far away from her father's palace. 
So after this night tells uh, Sir uh, tells the king that Sir Patrick Spins is the best person, uh, the king decides to uh, to send Sir Patrick Spins in this in this mission. Um, so this is exactly uh, stanza number one. The king sits in Dumpling Town drinking the blood red wine. And he says, oh, where will I get a good sailor to sail this ship of mine? This is stanza number one. And stanza number one means that the king was looking for a good sailor. And stanza number two is about the knight, the old knight. You know, knight means Ferris. The old knight who is supposed to carry out the mission. Uh, they mention him as Sir Patrick Spence. In your book, if you go back to page 43, and specifically to stanza number three, uh, the king uh, has written a letter uh, asking Sir Patrick Spence uh, to sail across the sea. Now, I want you to relate this stanza, which is a three, to stanza number one. Stanza number one shows the king sitting in his own palace and what is he doing? He is having fun and he is drinking blood red wine. Notice here the use of blood red wine. A description of the wine as red. So the king is having fun and drinking blood red wine. And while doing so, he is sending people to their death. Why would we say that he was sending them to, the, to their death? Because he wanted Sir Patrick Spence to sail across the sea to take his daughter to her husband during a very dangerous time of the year. It's the time of the storms when most ships would, would sink. Okay, now let us go to um, stanza number four. Uh, Sir Patrick Spence in stanza number four receives the letter from uh, his king. And how does he feel about it? He felt very sad. He turned into red. And if you look at uh, line 16, of course, I hope that you are following me. Uh, line 16, the tear blinded his E. Sir Patrick Spence became very sad. His eyes were, were blinded by tears. And this is very typical of ballads. In ballads, when they want to say that someone is sad, they always use this expression. The tear blinded his, his E. So Sir Patrick Spins um, received the news with sadness. He didn't want to sail across the sea. Why? Because it's a dangerous time of the, of the year. Now stanza number four which starts with line 17. Sir Patrick Spence asks, who has done this to me? Who has told the king that I am the best sailor? But here, there is an important question. Is it possible for Sir Patrick Spence to say no to his king? Of course not. He couldn't have refused the king's order. So what he did after he received the letter, after having uh, sort of cried, after he turned into red because of anger, but eventually uh, he had to uh, obey the king. So he said to his men, hurry up and let us uh, uh, sail across the sea in the early morning. Now his, um, his sailors tell him, uh, that it's a very dangerous time of the year. It's the time of the deadly storms. And uh, some of them even, if you go to uh, stanza number um, six, we notice that one of the, of the uh, sailors tells uh, Sir Patrick Spence that uh, he even had a look uh, at the sky and he believes that uh, there is an impending storm. Okay, but of course you can never say no to your king. So Sir Patrick Spence had to sail across the sea 
and to send the king's daughter to her husband. Um, so let us now go to uh, line 30. And specifically stanza number eight. In stanza number eight, we come to know that um, since the woman who will be taken to her husband is a princess, I think she needs uh, some, uh, some knights to go with her. So there were some Scottish nobles who should go with, with her. Okay. But um, it, it, it is typical of the ballads to have abrupt or sudden changes without even uh, preparation. So if we move to stanza number nine, which starts with line um, uh, 32 uh, or 33 actually, yes, 33, line 33, uh, suddenly we are told that the hats of the Scottish nobles were a boon. And a boon means above above the sea level and suddenly after that uh, we uh, go to uh, to the part that talks about the ladies the ladies of these knights and this is stanza number number nine stanza number nine talks about the ladies of the scottish nobles um, they were sitting and they were waiting for their um, for their husbands, and they had fans into their hands, fans, f a n s, fans, and this shows that these ladies are rich. They are rich ladies. So stanza number nine uh, takes us to the houses of the knights with their wives who are aristocratic and uh, and living in luxury. Uh, stanza number uh, 10. Oh, lang lang, may the ladies stand uh, with their gold kims in their hair, waiting for their own dear lords, for they see them na mare. Now, the ladies are aristocratic, as I said, and they are um, rich. In addition to having fans, they have gold kims, and kims means combs, C-O-M-B-S. Uh, you know, some of the combs that are used for decorating the hair of rich ladies, and they are made of gold. And this again shows the difference between Sir Patrick Spins and the Scottish nobles. The Scottish nobles are rich, and there are objects which show their luxury and the luxury that their ladies live in. Whereas Sir Patrick Spins is just a, a sailor. Uh, but uh, the, the surprising thing that if you, for example, look at uh, line 40, uh, they'll see them namir. This is exactly what I mean when I said abrupt beginnings and abrupt endings. That is sudden beginnings and endings. Um, the uh, poet was talking about the richness of the ladies and suddenly uh, he tells us that these ladies are not going to see uh, their husbands again. And this is exactly uh, what we have in Namir, which means no more. Yes, no more. Uh, then we move to the last stanza, the last one, which starts with half or half or to upper door. It's 50 fathom deep. Uh, and this um, fathom deep means fathom, fathom deep. S uh, there lies Sir, uh, Sir Patrick Spins with Scott Lords at his feet. Okay, guys, I want you to relate this to the idea of richness and poverty. 
Now, uh, in the uh, in the previous stanza, we noticed that there was a description of the richness of the ladies, and suddenly uh, the death of their lords. And the writer here emphasizes that Sir Patrick spins, and his uh, knights died, and the evidence was given. Uh, when we were told that their hats were above the sea level. Now, Sir Patrick Spins was not to be compared with the Scottish nobles during their lifetime. But after their death, uh, Sir Patrick Spins did not only become equal to them, but also superior, because they lie under his feet. So uh, during uh, their lifetime, the Scottish nobles out ranked Sir Patrick Spins. I mean they were of a higher uh, social status. But after their death, things turned upside down. Those who used to, to, to enjoy a high level are now of a lower level. And here we can feel that the poet is telling us that death uh, makes people equal and not only this death might even raise people who were of a lower position than uh, rich people and this is the tragic end that we have in the in the epic uh, sorry in the ballad so as you have noticed our ballad had a tragic or a sad end the ballad ended with the death of sir patrick spins and uh, his men and this is exactly what I told you about sad or tragic ends of, of, uh, of ballads. Okay. If we want to uh, sum up what happened in Sir Patrick Spins, because you told me several times that I have to be slow and to uh, simplify things for you, and I hope I am doing that. Sir Patrick Spence tells his men that they will sail in the morning. One man expresses the fear that there will be a deadly storm and that they will come to harm. Because he has seen an omen of danger. A circle rounding out the new moon. And this is the prophecy. A group of Scots noblemen are aboard the ship when it sinks. The ladies on the shore will wait in vain for their return. They will never see Sir Patrick Spence or his passengers again. Instead, deep in the sea, halfway between somewhere and Aperdor, Scotland, there lies Sir Patrick Spence with the Scots lords at his feet. Notice, his lords are at his, at his feet. So they died on their way back home, on their way back to Scotland. So the princess was sent safely to her husband and Sir Patrick Spence and the noble uh, men actually uh, didn't make it. Now I want to uh, again emphasize something about uh, the identity of the ballad. Uh, all ballads um, are formed according to quatrains. That is, uh, uh, ballads consist of quatrains, and Sir Patrick Spins is a ballad. So it is made up of quatrains, and uh, qua means four. So quatrains means stanzas of four lines with the uh, second and fourth lines rhyming, which is a, B, C, B. For example, if you look at stanza number one, you have town, wine, sailor, mine. Town and sailor do not rhyme, whereas wine and mine rhyme together. And if you look at the lines that I have here, I wanted to emphasize that... Um, Lines 2 and 4 are shorter than lines 1 and, and 3, okay? So lines 1 and uh, 3 are longer than 2 and 4, okay? Uh, so all the lines of 
سير باتريك سبينز ار فورمد انتو فورز كوترينز اند ايتش كوترين وود هاف ذيس رايم سكيم اي بي سي بي اند لاين 1 اند 3 ار لونجر ذان 2 اند اند 4 ذيس از اباوت ستراكشر اوكي Um, so here we come to the end of our lecture for today. I hope that I was able to communicate uh, with you effectively and I hope that I was able to uh, make it easy on you. Uh, this is the end of our lecture for today. I want to emphasize that we will spend uh, one more lecture talking about poetry And this is going to be uh, about modern poetry and what we call free verse. Till we uh, meet again, uh, thank you very much and goodbye.